Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their insights. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review as it will help others to learn about autism stories. On today's episode, Jade Stewart joins us to discuss the journey of unmasking and healing from trauma. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Jade, thanks so much for joining me here on Autism Stories. Thanks for having me. I'd love to start our conversation by learning where does your story in the autistic community begin? So for me personally, I, it kind of began about seven years ago. It started when I had my son. So I, I've got an older daughter as well. And I didn't really have some of the things crop up that kind of crops up for my son. And he he has a developmental language disorder diagnosis that he got quite young and I suspected that he also might be autistic. I tried to propose that and push that forward. The pediatricians was not in agreement. They said to me that he made eye contact. So that's what they told me. And that because he makes eye contact, that he can't be autistic. So then fast forward a little bit. We're going through school. He's having some struggles at school. Behaviorally, he's wonderful. He literally does not in any way, I guess, um, typically cause any sort of disruption for anybody around him. But internally, he definitely has a very different struggle. And academically, he also struggles. So he was being put forward for an EHCP, which over in England is um, an educational healthcare plan. I'm not too sure what that the equivalent might be um, over in the USA. But it's basically where you get allocated funding for your child to support their needs and in the middle of that which was now probably fast forward to maybe about four years ago they said to me and I kind of dropped the idea that maybe he potentially had autism because of obviously what I was told those years ago and the educational psychologist and the uh head teacher sat me down in this in this uh, meeting and said to me, we think that he might have autism as well. And I think that we really need to make sure that we get any support needs met in terms of his autism. So I was like, oh, okay, really interesting. Please do tell me why do you think that he might, you know, have autism? So they started to like begin to reel off these things. Like there was like, he's very, very logical. And some of the examples they give me was that he told me that he didn't believe in Santa because he had done his research and how could Santa and his elves deliver eight million presents in one night, even with the gift of magic? And I was like, yeah, okay, I understand why that is, I guess, extremely logical. <laughs> and then he was like, yeah, and he kind of does this when he's with his friends in class. And there was a bit like, and... We, we don't think that that's kind of typical. So I said, okay, what what else? And it was like, he's really hyper-sensory. So he has some hyper and hyposensitive um, sensory profiles. So he's undersensitive to pain, but he's oversensitive to smell and he's oversensitive to sound. And that he's hyper, hyper-emotional, so hyper-empathetic. So he might experience something where when you're in the middle of, feeling something emotionally, he will burst out in tears, even though it's for everybody else, not something that would cause a lot of emotion. So I'm like, okay, this is autism. And they was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, I need to go away and do some more research on this because I didn't realize this. Another thing that they noted was that he has extreme knowledge, but then gaps in knowledge. So I was like, I'm going to go away, do my research, and I'll get back to you. And in the midst of that research, which was like four years ago, I went down the rabbit hole that I never came back out of because I could relate naturally to all the things that my son did. And I never knew that that was kind of the, I guess, typically the female present presentation of autism. So I was like, oh, 
wait, I might be autistic. So I went down the kind of private sector route. I got a diagnosis and I have kind of been advocating for those, I guess, more high masking, the people who might not be typically picked up, um, supporting and advocating for those people ever since. And I'm here, <laughs> still doing that job now. I can relate to your son and Santa because I used to think the same thing. And then as I've learned about my autism over the years, I've I've thought about Santa and his executive functioning skills, like his time management to deliver that many presents in one day in all those time zones. Like I have a lot to work on. And I already do that. But that is really impressive by Santa. That is very impressive. I totally agree. And when they when they mentioned that, I was like, but he's right. And they're like, but it doesn't matter whether he's right. Like, that's not something that I guess uh, at the time, like a seven, eight year old child should be even like pondering on. But it's interesting that you said that you did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're the author of Unmasking Autism and Returning Home, which is a book of 100 unique uh, journal prompts to help people explore their experience and begin the journey of unmasking and understanding all parts of yourself. So I'm a big fan of journal prompts, but, but, and I'm, I'm wondering of the a hundred journal prompts, which have been most particularly helpful to you? I think two stood out to me when I had a look back through. So I got the book myself. So obviously it's available um, on Amazon for anybody to use, but and again, I'm quite happy to send a digital uh, copy to anybody for free. But in terms of taking the book myself and writing them out myself, I think that when I looked back, the ones that had the most notes on it, which I'm I'm going to say they've, they've got to be the best ones because they kind of bring up a lot of kind of internal work, a lot of thoughts, a lot of kind of processing or reprocessing, should I say. I think my two favourites would be what key experiences and behaviours make more sense to me now that I know that I'm autistic and diagnosed as autistic? And the other one for me, again, personally, would be in what ways do I view and experience the world differently to other people? And I think that those those ones are, are great ones because they, on, they almost open up a floodgate, don't they, of processing. I, I def definitely a floodgate because I was thinking, oh, only a couple of, of things. Like once I start thinking about that, like every day, like, you know, new things seem to pop up for me. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. It's it's like unlocking memories and seeing them with a pair of fresh glasses on, isn't it? Oh, definitely. You are an accredited counselor who specializes in helping people heal from low self-esteem or from their trauma. So those things definitely can be connected to masking for us as autistic people. What might be some first steps you take in supporting people to heal? It's a really great question. I think that it would depend for me on who I was working with. So I do work with obviously neurodivergent people, autistic people, ADHD, you know, a whole range. But I also work with people who are neurotypical too. But I think that the universal thing for everybody would be self-awareness, so increasing somebody's self-awareness and their kind of understanding of themselves, but also developing like a new and healthy relationship with themselves, which sounds really basic, but it's quite deep core work. And it's often stems and goes right back to their kind of belief systems and the things that they're taught and their kind of you know, upbringing their experiences and kind of almost going back, reprocessing that and healing that right from the core of where it kind of grew from but didn't develop to its full potential. So kind of definitely doing that work. And if there is any trauma there, which often there is, working on that trauma and healing those core beliefs. And then if I am working with somebody in particular who's autistic or ADHD, I think that it would be also encouraging the unmasking, because I think that unmasking is is so dangerous. Like, I mean, not the unmasking, masking is dangerous in terms of the consequences of masking. And I think that it might not feel safe for them to be completely themselves, but only when they are completely themselves will they be able to heal that space, if that makes sense. Definitely does. From what I understand, you're also well-versed in addressing race and culture-related trauma. Are there ways that that healing process can look 
different than healing from artistic trauma? Again, another really good question. I think that I'd have to come at this from two points, which is there are ways in which he's different, but there are also quite a lot of crossovers and a lot of similarities. Not that that makes them identical, but it may are all the same, but it makes them it makes them similar. So I think that the differences are the kind of individual experience of that person. So I think the source of the particular trauma that they're suffering from could be different. So an autistic person's trauma could look different to somebody who's experiencing trauma in relation to how their culture is different to their religion or how their race has kind of been, you know, scrutinized or made them feel like they have some sort of like internal um, low self-esteem as a consequence or it could be that, you know, the person who is autistic might not be necessarily um, able to learn to really, you know, love themselves as they are because they've been encouraged or, you know, almost, yeah, encouraged to be to be neurotypical. So I guess the sources of the trauma can always be different and we'd, all, we'd have to assess, personally, I have to assess that from like an individualised point of view. The social factors, obviously, from both, points of view so if you're looking at it as like um as like a spider gra- diagram the social factors can be different um and the therapy approach depending on those individual factors can potentially be different too because we again have to come at that from like a really individual point of view but i think that actually surprisingly or unsurprisingly there is actually more similarities and crossovers so not always obviously naturally um but a lot of Trauma can come from support systems or lack of support systems or gaps in support systems, uh, um, community, the lack of community, the lack of um, support within the community, the consequences that all the kind of breakdown of that has on the person's identity and their self-perception and their understanding of self. Um, and I think something, again, that is universal across race relationships race related issues and autistic related issues is the impact of like you know the societal like perceptions of them and the societal expectations of them too and that again falls down into both pillars and trauma can be formed under both of those through very very similar circumstances one of the visuals you shared uh not too long ago on social media that i've been thinking about a lot lately since i saw that is the pendulum of blame in adult relationships. And some people swing either to one side, which everything is their fault. Um, then they could swing to the other side where everything is the other person's fault, or there could be a balance between the two points of view. What are some things people can do in relationships you think to find that balance or get closer to that balance than they kind of consistently are? I think it's, again, a two-part approach. I think that this obviously comes down to relationships between you and another person. So it comes down to the approach that you have together and the approach that you have individually. So I think together, I think that we, you have to be both or we have to be both willing to be both balanced in our approach. Communication is something I hugely advocate for. I know it's not always easy and I know that we don't always have two willing participants in that, but if we're really willing to be authentic, transparent, almost vulnerable and real in the communication, we're a lot more likely to get to the source of the problem quicker. And I think that we both have to have a willingness as well. I think that we both have to be really willing to want to get to the middle of that pendulum swing and get the balance of this is not all your fault. This is not all my fault, actually. We're both playing a role in being in this relationship and how this communication is breaking down. I think that it's a percentage thing, so I'm not going to say that it's always 50-50. Sometimes it's absolutely not, and we have to to take that into consideration. But I think that the individual approach to kind of being more balanced is, again, doing that internal work, which I feel like I'm just saying all the way through this, but it is that having that self-awareness about your belief systems and the the kind of the sore points that bring up emotions for you that might make you more triggered or what might make you more activated i think that if you if you meet somebody who is able to take accountability for themselves and say do you know what i hold my hands up i definitely did that and i'm sorry i did that 
is so much easier to have a relationship with those people and it's learning to also be one of those people that's a that's a journey I've been on because I certainly wasn't always that way and it really really helps in terms of creating that balance between making relationships work and again that's not always an easy job but it definitely helps and I think just having that kind of accurate and fair assessment of each individual conversation you might be having because sometimes what we have a tendency to do and again I can absolutely say that I've done this historically is bring everything from the past that you've stored all the time that is the reason why you feel the way that you do in that moment but if we just take the individual situation and not bring in everything from the past it's easier to extinguish that and iron that out than it is to kind of and do that individually every single time so you don't have this mountain to deal with of all the things that are unresolved. Definitely. Now, you own your own private therapy practice, so I'm wondering how that works for you in the sense of your autism and all the stressors that come for all of us uh, regarding employment. So essentially, has your private practice been helpful in reducing the risk of burnout and mental health challenges that employment can create in our lives as autistic people? Absolutely. I can, and again, I know that it's not for everybody, but I can advocate for it enough. It completely saved me because, so I've been in employment previously. I worked a lot in schools and colleges and things like that. I then was doing both. So I was in private practice with JMS Wellbeing, and I was also in employment and it was completely unmanageable for me personally to do both, um, to just be kind of a functioning human being at the end of the day after the excessive expectations on me. I think being in self-employment helps me balance that and I'm able to be really authentic and integral with who I am and my Clients are aware that that is the person that they're getting into therapy with. Like, don't get me wrong, I don't just like, I don't, I don't just like stop work or anything like that. But what I do, what I do say is that I will look after you, and I will always prioritize your needs. But, but, but understand that I also do that same thing for myself. So they're already aware of that. Whereas I don't think I'm always, or I don't think many people are always able to do that in employment. Say, for example, it's like, oh, well, we have an open evening tonight. And we expect you to be there, you know, unpaid, you're exhausted and you just have to because it's an expectation on you. I wouldn't necessarily be able to advocate for myself. That actually, that is kind of outside of my capacity today or that's outside of my capacity because I've got a lot that I'm dealing with, you know, in terms of meeting my child's needs, my, you know, his um, school needs and, you know, also being a functioning mum when I get home or a functioning wife when I get home. I, I'm not able to, what's the right word for that? Stay within capacity. And I am able to do that now in self-employment. And the the best way that I do that is understanding myself well and making sure that I never have to put myself or my clients in a position where they're not having that adequate care. And lastly, how can our listeners learn about you and your services beyond this interview? So the best places to probably find me are either my Facebook page, if you kind of like to see like, I might put some of my like resources on there or just write a post on there. So that would be on, on Facebook, it would be JMS Wellbeing Center. Or if you like more video content, which is what I like, you can also find me on YouTube, which would be Jade at JMS Wellbeing. Well, Jade, I'm so thankful I got the opportunity to meet you. And thanks so much for joining me here on Autism Stories. Thank you so much, Doug. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate you giving me this space. Thanks so much to Jade for the conversation. To learn more about Jade and her services, please check out the link in the podcast description for this episode. We always love hearing from you and would especially love to hear from you relating to this episode on, have you tried journaling to a prompt and what was your experience like? Did you know Autism Personal Coach provides neurodiversity affirming support by autistics for autistics? We empower autistic adults and teens to lead self-directed, purpose-driven lives through customized life coaching and community groups. Our distinct approach prioritizes each client's unique goals and preferences, fostering a sense of agency and promoting self-advocacy. 
Coaches work collaboratively with clients to develop personalized strategies and tools that can help with executive functioning, emotional regulation, relationship building, stress management, and much more. We also support parents and partners of autistic individuals by providing insights and guidance to bridge communication gaps and nurture mutual understanding. With our accessible remote services, individuals from any location can receive the assistance and mentoring they need. So please join us today to experience judgment-free coaching rooted in empathy, expertise, and respect for autistic identity. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.